Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Well, this is uh, going to be our closing plenary session. And uh, well, it is uh, an honor for me to introduce um, three friends, three colleagues. And uh, let me just see something very short. So, to be there, CV to be here, CV three, four days for each of them. So, yes, CV, let me tell you. And Mary Francis was Dean of the College of Education at the University of Illinois, Urbana Champaign in the United States from 2006 to 2016. And before this, she was Dean of the Faculty of Education, Language and Community Services at RMIT University in Melbourne, in Australia. He's a professor in the Department of Education, Policy Organization, and Leadership at the University of Illinois. He and Mary Francis are directors of Common Ground Research Networks, a not for profit organization developing and applying new policy technologies. Dr. Nancy Tidides, she holds a PhD in the Learning, the Learning Design and Leadership Program from the University of Illinois, in Washington. Her research interests include advanced digital technologies, artificial intelligence, user experience research. Learn design, online education, as well as language and culture learning. The presentation that we bring today is entitled Meaning Without Borders from Chance Languaging to Chance Position in the Era of Digital Language Learning. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director. It's, 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 it's already on. I don't know. Yes, I have to do something. Because. Of. Oh, because. <laughs> Thank you. Well, hello to everybody who's here physically and to the no, it's not on. Now it's on. I had the first update. Thank you. <laughs> right to uh, hello to all of you who are here in person and to those of you who are online uh, and have stayed to the end. Can I say first, you are the heroes of the conference. Staying to the intellectual heroes because you stay to the very end to uh, understand that purpose of this conference and to relate to each other about the issues that really matter. So it's much appreciated. Uh, Bill and I have been collaborators uh, for many decades now. We are researchers and practitioners. Those two things are intertwined for us. Uh, it's ideas and action. That matters. Ideas without action, theories without action, well, are just that, right? So what we're going to present to you today is a slice of our most recent thinking about ideas, uh, because we live in uh, 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 an era that's mediated by the digital. There's no escaping it. And it wasn't just COVID that did that. You know, we were trending in this direction in all domains. And education was one place where it was the devil. You know, technology was regarded as something even you know, that wasn't about uh, teaching and learning and wasn't about people to people. But we know that's not, the, not true anymore because our learners come to us engaged in um, uh, and their lives mediated by technology across all the banks. So I'm just here to introduce uh, two of my colleagues. It's really happy. I'm really happy to say that a doctoral student is now Dr. Tsiridis, and she's our colleague. It's wonderful to have her here at this conference, presenting for the first time as Dr. Tsiridis. And she's going to present to you a practical example of the kinds of ideas that uh, Bill and I have been working on as theorists uh, for many decades now. Uh, we call it translanguaging and transposition. I'll speak more about that. But essentially, we have to not just know the materiality of the digital, but understand its grammar, the way it works, and its potential. And they're the two things that we are going to present to you today. And so I'm going to move away from here 
and I'll get the last word, but I'm going to hand over to Phil now. Well, thank you everybody for being here at this late hour on the third day of the conference. It's been, a, uh, it's been a conference of a lot of words, and I'm afraid we're about to um, go through some more words with you. So for about 20 minutes or so, I'm going to talk um, in general terms about these ideas, translanguaging and transposition, this word that Mary and I have been working on recently, and on Nancy as well. Then on Nancy's going to talk about some work that she did in her PhD project where we're working together uh, around um, in these multilingual environments, teaching and learning in these environments. Um, there's a quote um, uh, down the bottom. This, this presentation, by the way, is a chapter. So uh, and I, I reread it just now. It's not yet published. It's in a book called Multifaceted Multilingualism, um, being published by um, John Benjamins in Amsterdam in um, well, it's taken a couple of years, next year it'll be published, but if people want a version of the academic piece on which this talk is based, we can give you a, a preprint of that, just ask us first. I, I read it again now and I thought, oh my goodness, there's so much stuff in this and it's so, so it's difficult. These, these ideas are difficult, but we've been trying to struggle with this conjunction, as Mary said, of a plurilingual world um, and technology. Um, and, and one of the lessons is that it's a surprisingly big change. The more you think about it um, and the more deeply you work in this area, uh, we're in a, a moment of a radical flux and radical change. And I think in this talk, we can only give a, a rough sense of that. Um, if you want the painfully difficult academic version of the paper, it's, it's there for your, just tell us and we'll send you a link. It's, it's actually on our new learning blog, which is in Scotland. I can send you the link. So um, first half, is me, second half is on Nancy, and then Mary will kind of tell us where we went wrong. Uh, oh, it's the mouse. Thank you. Not the arrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, firstly, this translanguaging work, which is um, uh, around a lot now. And in fact, that's the word at the top. It's a Welsh word. And the interesting thing is that it's gone out of its original context. Um, and as a matter of fact, it was this, um, Sam Williams wrote uh, his dissertation in Welsh in 1994, um, and it wasn't translated into English as translanguaging until 2003. It's become a big word ever since, but that's the original word. And one of the reasons why I put that there is, um, firstly, to have some quotes there from Williams himself as the originator of this, this concept and this, this idea. Um, but also, um, the Welsh context is very specific, and one of the points that uh, that I want to make in, in this part is that, in fact, in any set of language pairs, when we're talking about language differences, there are different dynamics of power and different dynamics going on. It's not a generic dynamic. So in, in the case here, um, he interestingly wrote his PhD in Welsh, and that's part of Welsh nationalism to try and build an academic language in a language which was originally a vernacular language. So in, in every case, that it's between, in Wales, it's between English and Welsh as two different languages. It's about unequals and it's about transitions and it's about movements between languages which are intrinsically unequal and their political acts at each, each point. And there are no two politics in any language pairs which are quite the same. So translanguaging is this generic word, as if all translanguaging is translanguaging, but I'm kind of saying there's no two translanguages which are remotely similar to each other. And it's the mouse which will move to the next slide. So, in fact, behind translanguaging is this idea of language mixing. And in um, language studies, there have been lots of versions of this idea already. It's not as if this is a terribly new idea. Um, and I want to try to uh, delineate the way in which the literature um, frames it as a new idea. So code switching has been around for a long time. Translation, that's an old fashioned idea. We do one language another. Bilingualism, bilingual education, hybridity, multiliteracies. But the questions that the translanguaging people ask about each of these is whether there are artificial separations being made. So code switching is, just, you know, that here's this long called language, and here's another one, and we're switching from one thing to another. Um, language, uh, translation is about these um, target languages and the dilemmas of the, the transposability of one meaning to another. And um, in a way, the most powerful critiques in the translanguaging space 
are of practices like bilingual education, which was a critique, which was about uh, often about immigrant contexts. Um, uh, and the de debate has been about additive and subtractive. You might use uh, bilingual education as a strategy for Im immigrant groups in order to move them into the dominant language. But in each case, um, the argument is it treats those languages as distinct and separate, where in social practice, they're profoundly mixed with each other. Um, and often in the case of bilingual education, it's you know, immersion models where in a particular classroom, you're just using one language strictly only in, in order to, to, uh, to get into the language. And in fact, what's behind uh, the translanguaging um, uh, literature is a set of critiques about those practices. So um, now in the paper, there's a kind of a literature review part where we, where we go through each of these concepts and talk to the, talk to the, main, uh, the main exponents of each of these ideas. Hybridity is about these between spaces. It's not about the mixed upness of either space at either end. It's about a middle space. Multiliteracies, which is a work the work that Mary and I have been working on for a long time, um, is about language in a larger social semiotic um, context. So these are kind of um, a number of the key concepts. Now, um, I get this mouse situation. Uh, ah, so this is a key quote from Garcia and um, Klaifkin, um, um, where trans, you know, it, it's a it's a political it's a political decision to be somewhat different from all these other practices. And um, the most powerful example of, or the most powerful site in which this concept is being um, uh, applied now is the U.S. context, where there are. Um, Spanish language people from other parts of the Americas in the United States and translanguaging is a kind of practice which values the language brought into the classroom as a way of building language skills in both languages. The interesting thing though is the politics is very different from Williams that politics in, in Wales. It's a different set of social contexts and different set of reasons. So if anything to distinguish translanguaging from that other list of things, code switching, translation, whatever, it's this particular political uh, orientation. Now, to, to come on now to uh, an idea that Mary and I have been developing um, lately over the last few years, coming out of the multiliteracies framework, we've been developing this concept of transposition, which is where we swap out meanings for each other. And that could be swapping out, you know, one language for another, but also what we do perennially in this globalized digital environment, we, we swap out meanings in a number of other modes, gestural, visual, and so on. Um, um, but when that swapping out happens, whether it's across languages or across, um, we're using the word forms of meaning now, and I'll give you the reasons why in a second. Um, but when we do this, the meaning's never the same. It's a, you're intending to mean something, there's a commonality to the two things, um, but, but the affordances of each context mean that it's never quite the same. So the way in which we conceive the multiliteracies framework now is in terms of these transpositions and in a multimodal, multilingual, web-based digital environment, that these kinds of movements are going on all the time in the environments in which we work. But one of the points we want to make, and I don't have the time to go into this in detail, you can see here we've color coded these, these things. These are things which have meaning in them. Objects have meaning in them, body in the form of gesture and demeanor and what you're wearing and that kind of stuff. So these are things which are meanings in the world, uh, which all leverage off each other. Right? If you think of pragmatics as a domain of uh, linguistics, that's about those things that leverage off each other. But we've kind of color coded this where we've made text and speech maximally different in terms of the colors that we've, uh, that we've got here. Um, and what we've been trying to do is actually in this multimodal digital world is problematize the idea of language because what language does is it, 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 it aggregates two things which are profoundly different. We want to actually say text and speech are profoundly different. So speech happens in the context of sound, often accompanied by body, which are arrangements in time, right? So in other words, speech essentially happens in a temporal kind of way. And if I want to recover from something that I said, you know, it's actually unrecoverable. Once I've said something, it's too darn late. And it happens in these circular, repetitive, classic example, by the way, is that speech has no sentences. 
if you would have taken part of what I'm just saying now, which is not written, it's just me kind of talking in an extemporaneous way. It's a pile of clauses uh, without clear separations, whereas when we're in text, we're doing stuff in sentences. But also what we're doing in text is we're, uh, we're arranging stuff in space. So if you take now these screens here, these are arrangements in space which juxtapose icon and text and image. Um, um, and these things are essentially spatial arrangements. Uh, speech and sound and body are temporal arrangements. Um, and one of the things we want to say is that in the digital world particularly, um, if you take something like text, if I was scribing something by hand, um, uh, it, it's really limited by the inability to edit without making a darn mess of the page. Whereas what we're doing with text in a digital text environment is we're thinking more spatially and more hierarchically and more structurally about our work because we can go and move the cursor up there and we can pull something down there and we can... Um, so it's actually be text becoming more of a spatial design activity uh, than it ever was in the past. Right. So we've got some quite long and difficult arguments about this radical difference, but what we want to do is we've stopped using the word language because text and speech are so different, particularly in this digital world. Now, um, what we're also concerned about is this question of diversity. So um, uh, this on the right, so with multi literacies, we have always said there's two multis. People think about these multi-form, you know, these multi-modal things, the stuff on the right, which I've just spoken to. But what we're talking about is the situational differences of life goods. So what um, translanguaging does, it's still kind of operating with a category of language, these things which, yeah, they say the name of the language is a, a new word, whatever, whatever. It's still using that word. But what we're saying is the differences in our forms of expression uh, take these um, you know, are, are contextually related to symbolic embodied material differences. And here in the next slide is a kind of more elaborate version of these holistic meaning systems, visual, embodied, uh, spatial, um, uh, you know, textual, spoken, right, where the variations between these are infinite and, and where within any one named thing in that space, that name thing might be Spanish, or it might be a country or what, there are these enormous variations. So what we've got is any act of um, uh, doing work in literacy is about dealing with the differences. So what we've often done in language learning is learn the rules. Well, it's actually about learning how to negotiate the differences in every interaction across these different dimensions. And what we've also mentioned in here is this question about, well, what's our justice? Um, orientation in this kind of environment. So this says a, a lot in a small space. Now, what we've been doing is developing this idea of what we call a transpositional grammar. And we've been trying to think about how one describes meaning patterns, the patterns of meaning in the world across these different forms. So there are the forms which we showed you in the, 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 the wheel diagram. And then what we're doing is we're talking about functions. So how can we talk about these things as functions? So reference we might have been in an old world called those damn things nouns. Um, uh, agency might be about action words. I mean, I'm being a bit overly simplistic about this thing. We wanted to kind of develop a language with which we can describe holistically multimodal meaning. So if I take these functions down at the left there, these are five questions that we're suggesting you can ask about meaning. So on this screen, it's not just language, it's image and it's icon and it's, it's, it's the whole lot. So if we wanted to parse what's happening in any one of these environments in a multimodal way, a multi-form way, we might ask these five questions. Now, for those of you who are into the arcane world of linguistics, the first three are somewhat like Halliday's um, three metafunctions, um, reference agency structure, and the two, um, you know, in the systemic functional system, context sits outside of language, uh, an interest is purposes in the Haberdain system. Again, if, if you want to try and track it back to the history of, of other, uh, other grammars in the past, that's, that's what we're trying to do. We're, we're trying to reduce this to a number of relatively straightforward questions you can ask, which you would ask equally of an image or a text. Um, and then we go into more detail about what's happening in each of these things. Now, here are two examples of the kinds of texts we have in the world today. 
Um, these happen to be, I mean, we have a, for this work, we have a Facebook um, page and a um, uh, Twitter feed here, um, and please go and join them. Um, but what we have here is this crazy mix of icons and images um, down, and, and also one of the interesting things is this increasing, in a multilingual world, this increasing use of ideographs. So these ideographs down the side are often kind of standardised, by the way, in one of the arcane of our digital world, in this universal scripting system called Unicode. Um, some of the words, um, a, uh, some of these icons here uh, look differently from Android to iOS. They look differently from um, Twitter to Facebook, but the underlying semantics is rigidly, well, not rigidly, um, um, non-negotiably uh, coded in Unicode. So this is the world that we're in, and how do we parse this page? You know, we've had these practices of parsing in literacy, um, but now we're parsing um, image and icon, and, uh, and, and um, so these are the kind of textual things that we need to be thinking about as, as language teachers. Now, in terms of digital transpositions, um, and uh, well, Nancy's going to be talking about this more practically in, in her session around um, uh, the uh, AI and, and all those kinds of things and some of the tools we, we've been working on. But what we have now is we have these devices. This is a trip that, um, just a, 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 an Uber trip. Um, and what's interesting is we have these devices which do simultaneous translation and how do they do it? How do they actually work? And how do we teach students to use those things effectively? And the answer is um, around, um, and we go into this in detail in some other places, around the absolute specification of proper nouns in the world in a way which is beyond language. So the, the proper nouns are the, the locations in this, the common nouns are the classification systems which are the fields which underlie this, um, and that what happens is that those meaning systems now are actually happening translingually because this screen that I happen to be looking at in English, I could be looking at in Arabic, I could be looking at anything. And in fact, natural language in these systems is becoming arbitrary. That's a difficult, life, complicated idea. Let me just throw that out to you. So how do we actually operate um, in these digital environments effectively? And what's the role of language teaching where I don't need to be able to talk to this driver anymore, but I need to be able to use these systems effectively. And I need to be in control of how these systems work rather than just a, um, uh, uh, you know, kind of a, a passive user of them. So language of, um, of agnostic, ontology driven. So what's underneath these things are technical ontologies where, you know, location and time and space are all absolutely specified. That's, what, that's the language which drives these systems and parsing how they work is now uh, an important um, part of understanding the role of language in communication and the methods of language in communication in the world. So ironically, let me be provocative and say two contrary things for a moment. Um, ironically, um, we might not need language teachers anymore because we've got these things which are our prostheses, which we talk into. Uh, but there's something paradoxical about this. For small languages which are about, which are threatened, um, these kinds of systems can also create uh, viability for alternative cultures rather than to be overrun by English or dominant languages or whatever. Because so there's the possibility of supporting language diversity as well. It's a complicated dynamic, is what we're, what, what we're kind of saying here. And it's very important for us to, uh, to understand that dynamic and understand where all this stuff is going. So, what we're proposing now, how am I going for time? You're the time goods, uh, Tatiana. I'm already, I'm already 20 minutes. Oh, I'm going to stop then. Um, um, we're proposing this idea called um, another language learning, um, where um, which has this handy acronym all, where in fact language learning is about these very very different language pairs and different like, different uh, different dynamics of learning, where the difference of um, between learning an academic language in a country of immigration, um, or the difference between learning a heritage language or an indigenous language. They're very different, and the language pairs, the politics are very different from one uh, from one to the next. I was going to give a couple of examples, but I'm not going to now because you've got lots of examples. Okay. So I'll hand over to you on this. Yeah. 
it's like a click through notes. Okay. So uh, I will talk about the project that I did on my dissertation, which implements some of these uh, concepts that Dr. Cook just talked about. And uh, the theory that I had um, based my project was a combination of translanguaging and all these ideas of transposition and of modality. But I combined these with digital affordances and specifically like oh, whatever, what capabilities and what functionality the digital tools can offer us. But also in combination with online intercultural exchanges, again, by taking advantage of the digital in order to um, have a better understanding of the intercultural uh, ideas uh, when learners are interacting. So based on this framework, uh, we designed the smart online language learning modules and we used these three principles to design them. The first one was translanguaging and multimodality and why would we focus on that? Because uh, harnessing the prior knowledge of students and their experience and expertise matters for meaning making and it helps them, it, it helps uh, educators and technology designers to prepare their learners and their users for meaning making in a contemporary world where we use different modes and we use the digital as part of our everyday lives. And this brings us to the second principle as well, the use of AI tools, uh, which uh, was used in this project in order to enhance students' digital literacy and help them be prepared again for the real world. But also, um, we focus on that principle in order to evaluate and test the AI tools and make them better in order to um, promote better learning. But we combine it with the online intercultural exchanges uh, because different cultural backgrounds matter in meaning making. And uh, we wanted to improve that intercultural understanding through the use of the digital. However, all these principles that we use um, are important, but they are uh, very related to the context that we um, implemented it. So this is our, these are general ideas, but if they are going to be implemented in other contexts, they need to be redesigned, re-evaluated and modified. The concepts are there, but the example that I'm going to give is uh, very, um, is uh, related to the context that we were um, implementing. So some things about the implementation. Uh, we created two courses uh, teaching Greek and English and Spanish and English at the same time. So we brought native speakers of Greek and native speakers of English in one course and native speakers of uh, Spanish and English in another course. And we were teaching two languages at the same time. So we collaborated with higher education institutions in Greece, the University of Patras, in Spain, the University of Granada, and in the US, uh, University of Illinois, Urbana, Champaign. And we taught these courses online. Uh, and the target languages were obviously in Greek, English, and Spanish, and the language level was low intermediate A2 based on the European framework. So, what did we do? How we designed them, how we delivered them, and how they were evaluated. Um, continuing about what Dr. Cook said before about using digital tools as cognitive processes and uh, basically using tools as an extension of what the humans can do and uh, our human capabilities. We had as our main platform, the City Scholar platform, which uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar, but it is a social learning platform that supports peer-to-peer -peer learning, collaborative interactions, formative assessment, and reflective practices. It has three main elements. Creator, which is a multimodal uh, work creation space where students can create their uh, artifacts. And it also has a peer review functionality based on rubrics. Um, it also has the community space where uh, learners and users can interact in a social media-like environment. And also it has analytics, which is an automatic formative assessment tool. In this platform, we created some another tool and we embedded it and we connected it together, which is called CGMAP. And it is a text annotation concept mapping tool and that we used uh, in order to improve the peer review process. And in this um, interface, we also added Google Translate to help students because it was a language learning course and we wanted to test the AI part. So we incorporated uh, machine translation. And of course, Zoom was used to facilitate the live session that we had. Um, about the AI and how we use this, I wanted to um, refer to the two ideas that we, that the 
Talan said about uh, AI, and we use some tools in the broad meaning of AI, we refer to the tools that can do processes that cannot be easily done by humans. And this was an, an example of this that we used were a learning analytics tool that captures automatically the performance of the students and helps them to understand uh, in which stage they were during the course. But also, uh, in this sense, we used machine translation in order to facilitate meaning making and peer interactions and communication. However, on another idea of artificial intelligence, we uh, implemented the labeling technique of the supervised machine learning, and we had students tag their translingual and multimodal text that they were using when they were for previews and annotations. And through this process, we created a database that can be used later to provide automatic feedback on translingual and multimodal text for future learning experience. In this um, case, though, we tested if this has value, if it's meaningful, and we created this database that can be used later. So let's see the learning design. What did it have? Um, these are the recurring elements that were happening every week. So we had the language familiarization element, uh, which had as a goal proficiency. There were these were videos of the vocabulary, grammar, syntax, common phrases in context, and they were bilingual. So they were uh, in both languages and they were provided to all the students the same video. We had also the multimodal brochure, uh, which was the output, the final product that the students had to uh, submit for the course. And it was an evolving art artifact um, that was uh, following a scaffolding course in order to uh, produce it based on what they were learning. The virtual, virtual cafe was um, the place where we were coming together and the students were interacting and they were communicating using translanguaging and multimodal. We also had some self-reflection activity, both on CT Scholar and CT Math, targeting metacognition where students were reflecting on what they were learning and about language and culture, and basically they were taking responsibility of their own learning. But also we had the peer review engagement uh, with the targeted collaborative interactions and they were learning from each other. So they had an active role in the, in the learning process by using the technology because all these uh, elements were supported by the technology. And I'll talk a little bit uh, more about each of these. So the language familiarization, there were videos uh, targeting the construction of knowledge and we created the learning module in CD Score and this is just an image of what it looked like. Uh, so students were uh, first um, watching their videos and then they were coming to the virtual cafe. They didn't have to prepare math to come to the live session. They were just, uh, we had a topic each week, a thematic topic, and they were just bringing some images, maybe videos related to the topic. But when we were coming together, um, it was kind of informal interaction, authentic. They were using whatever kind of uh, um, uh, modality they wanted to use to communicate and uh, they were interacting with each other in breakout rooms, but also in, as a whole group. About the creation of the multimodal brochure, um, the first part of it uh, in creating it, it was to um, every week to create a section of it that it was translingual, multimodal, and authentic. So it was specifically asked from them to create it in any way they wanted without any restrictions, because uh, I'll talk um, the following steps. Based on the following steps, they were revising it and they will, at the end, they will they would submit a product that was in the target language, but during the creation of it, they were using any kind of mode they wanted. And these are some examples of uh, what it looked like. So you can see that there were a lot of images, videos, use of multiple languages, um, and that's how it progressed. But, uh, this was the first part, and then once they were creating the first version, they were going to sit them up and they were annotating their own text, and they were reflecting on uh, how they used uh, multimodality, why I used multiple modes, why I used my native language here. And they were also using the translation tool in order to um, uh, take any parts that were in their native language and transform them to the target language. So they were reflecting on uh, what am I learning? What, what am I missing? How I can become better? Also, uh, as a reflection update after its virtual cafe, uh, we were asking them to post, um, make a post in the community of CD Scholar to again reflect on what am I learning from my peers during the live sessions? 
and how this can help me uh, uh, in the course. So that was the self-reflection activities. And then the peers were coming in and they were providing their feedback. So for the multimodal brochure, the peers were giving annotations on based on rubrics. This was guided. And also they were giving general reviews about um, the use of the target language in the in each section every week that the students were creating of the multimodal brochure. And they were offering suggestions about First of all, how they form the text, how they use the translation tool, if the translation tool had a good, like a proper outcome, and how they can improve it. And also, they were interacting in City Scholar about their uh, what they were learning in the virtual level. So it wasn't only a self reflection, but they were interacting with each other to understand what other are what others are gaining, uh, and this way they were ex exchanging their knowledge. So these were the basic elements. And now I will move on um, to what the students said about their experience for each of these parts. So about the use of the digital technologies that we had in this project, um, students uh, experienced some issues. And you can see that because it was, a, especially for the city map tool, it was the first time that it was being implemented in a real uh, environment. So there were some difficulties in the beginning. But as you can see, they say it was a little difficult to learn at first. And this goes for both tools. But as you can see, the actual functionalities of the tools were very helpful for them. The annotations, the self annotations, the peer reviews, they say that it was one of the best ways to learn. Um, the annotations, translation, and community, they made them look back at their work, referring to metacognition and understanding what they were learning. And of course, the learning analytics were very engaging and very motivating for them because they could track um, their progress and how they are doing the course. So overall, from uh, this implementation, we could see that uh, this type of digital tools could support language learning. They enhance students' metacognition and digital literacy. But familiarity with the technology and actually practicing it and uh, using it is required in order to get the benefits of uh, their functionalities. About the translanguaging and multimodality and how it was used, <coughs> students were very happy and very uh, excited that they were using uh, translanguaging and they were in an environment where they, uh, they were uh, able to use their native languages. So you can see their comments, they were very comfortable in speaking the target language. Uh, the environment was open and making mistakes, as they said, because they could they considered mistake the fact that they were using their native, their native languages. But in order to achieve this type of environment and have this type of benefit, it was important um, the way that the teacher introduced this concept. So it's very important to consider um, teacher training when we are implementing these kind of practices. So I will move on here because, yes, translanguaging and multimodality uh, through this project. Uh, it was so that it increased their uh, students' confidence in target language use. It helped them uh, to improve their writing and speaking skills. It promoted successful communication and meaning making. But the traditional habits about the use of separate, uh, about the separate use of uh, languages, both on the side of the students and on the teacher, influenced the uh, way the practices were implemented. That's why, again, teacher training is important. About the peer to peer interactions, um, either considering social and cultural interactions or collaborative knowledge production and the peer reviews, students again were very excited to meet with their uh, peers because they work from other countries, they make uh, uh, new friendships, uh, they build relationships. They said that this was the most engaging part of the course. And, but also, they mentioned a lot that the peer reviews and this actual process of providing feedback and annotation. It helped them uh, really uh, very much to actually uh, improve their target language. And also another comment that I really like from um, the student is that uh, during the virtual cafes uh, that they were interacting with each other, they weren't only implementing uh, and focusing on learning the language because they were using their native language, their target language, they were communicating, which was the main goal of, to improve their target language, but also through this whole process, they were getting and they were discussing different topics and they were gaining knowledge on different subjects that they found useful they could use in, uh, in other situations of their lives. 
So overall, of course, peer-to-peer uh, -peer interactions uh, were found very beneficial for uh, both target languages and to uh, enhance engagement and motivation in language learning settings. Uh, and uh, overall, about the design that we implemented, I have here some quotes from the students that they uh, wrote on City Scholar uh, during the final virtual, at the end of the virtual cafe, actually, the final virtual cafe. And you can see that they were very excited uh, that they participated. They were very sad that it was, it was only four weeks. And many of them said, oh, we, we would like to have more sessions. We would like to have more weeks uh, to interact with uh, our peers. And it was so nice to uh, meet all of them. And you can see that they even had comments saying um, uh, they were using different, like both languages at the comments. Um, but what I want to point out before I show you this video, because I wanted to hear what they said, uh, is that, again, this is uh, an example of a learning design that was implemented in this context. And it says, I mean, we can see that it was successful, but purposeful design adaptation is necessary if we want to take it to a different context. And evaluating and evolving it is necessary for future implementations. And now I, I hope that this can... Yeah, we're okay. technical issues, but it wasn't that the So you could see that they were very, very happy. And <laughs> I will yeah. just oh, move it. I no, certainly. I'll just use the mic for it. Yeah. Okay. Is that going to work? Can I do this? Just kind of mark the mic Are we going to use it? This, this one, sorry. Oh, okay. It's good. I think the design matters, and I didn't know the design. So thank you. <laughs> You've all been so patient and you've been with me. But what we've been trying to say to you is shockingly radical. Because you heard Bill say to people interested in language that we don't think language is what language teachers should do in the age of digital mediated mini making. We talk about mini making, not language. And why have we shifted to mini making? Because language is now only one part of it, right? It's only one part of mini making for our learners, the ones in schools, in the workplaces. They're making meaning using multiple modes of communication. They're making meaning using multiple language forms. So what are we doing as teachers? Saying way back then when we were just having a target language and focusing on the target language, getting them to remember it, parsing, pedagogically doing things that are no longer appropriate for the generation of people who are in us. So it's shockingly radical. Ms. Safina has the two books to took us many years to write about the Cambridge, about needing a new grammar, right? The grammar that we have for teaching language is only about alphabetical literacy, right? And, and what we've been trying to say is that we need a grammar that can incorporate the other modes and multiple shifts in, in different languages. So we've called it a transpositional grammar, right? But, and, and we have shown how you can ask five questions of every mode, right? And um, you can have different uh, mixes of that mode and that you have to be aware of the nature of the transpositions and their power. And what uh, Almancy has demonstrated, that it's possible to do. It is possible to do it. And she was able to do it and she harnessed the technology because you can't do it with one teacher, 30 students on your own. It's too hard. You have to work in a team to transition to preparing our learners for multimodal meaning making today. If, the, if you want them to be uh, good citizens, learners, and workers. And of course, that's what we're preparing them for. And, you know, we talk about um, prosthesis, you know, 
that the digital is now a prosthesis. We carry it in our bags, we have it on our hands. You know, we use it all the time when we're in a taxi cab, when we're with the doctor, when we're with the, the digital is, has become key to meaning making. And we as educators, particularly ones who are involved in meaning making, right, meaning making, effective meaning making for today and the future, need to have an expanded view beyond target alphabetical mm. symbolic languages uh, uh, and the traditional pedagogies that come with us. But it's not easy. Oh, Nancy had to work with the team. She had to work with the coder. You know, she, she, she brought other people in to evaluate. Uh, and it's an issue of design. So all teaching today is design. It's not the textbook and my technique, pay attention, listen to me, repeat. You have to design in collaborative teams. So it's shockingly radical, but it's the end of the conference and you put this topic on the agenda. <laughs> you know, if you're gonna talk about pluralism, you know, and intercultural learning, which is so important, it's not about your heart. It's about the skills and the tools we use in order to accommodate pluralism or multimodal meaning making and the intercultural understanding, which is so critical for the world at the moment. And I think uh, our Nancy, in her little example, has powerfully shown that these learners, and in their voice, right, they found it hard, they found it difficult using new tools, but they wanted to use the new tools. And you have to make the online collaborative, right? It's not just about upload, download, do the degrees at the end. And most of our LMSs, that's what they do. But she used Scholar, and we've gone, we haven't spoken about that, but we have deliberately worked with engineers, with computer scientists, with philosophers, with English majors to create a platform that is for our values and purposes, which is peer to peer, which is collaborative, and which assesses as you go, not at the end to say you're proficient, you're not proficient, you get A, you get B. You have to get instant feedback in order to modify and to learn. And peers can teach each other, and our research shows that you know, if you have continuous uh, three peers uh, responding, it's as good as the one teacher who never has time to get to anybody. So I hope, I hope this has been you know, a way to finish off the conference with some theoretical, difficult theoretical issues that we're throwing at you and difficult proposals about what you have to be as an educator, but with an example that gives hope. <laughs> and uh, I think that's all I have in bringing it all together. You have a, um, Bill, do you want to say something about this? Oh, yes. So everybody, look, for what it's worth, uh, members of the conference, you all have access to Scholar. If you want to, um, some of the, the event module, you're in that, but the other module, some of the other modules that um, Paul Nancy mentioned are there for you to access as well. If you want more access to some of these stranger tools they're working on, the mapping tool, the analytics tool, we can give you access to those if you like. So we're, we're using this as kind of an experimental space, but you're very welcome to use it as well. And if you need more access than what you have at the moment, we, we can give you that. Um, up there is a couple of places where um, for our work, the academic work we do, we stay connected with the world. The um, new learning is a community and scholar. So if you go and join that community, which is easy to do, just go look for community, search new learning. Um, that one there with the, the green pencil, there are a few things called new learning, I think, but that one there, and if you go and join that, that will give you an update that, that's a kind of Mary and my blog where the research we're doing, um, we post on that. And we also have a Facebook page and a Twitter feed as well for that. So that's just, a, if you want to stay connected with this work that we're doing, that's just, that's how to do it. So I think we've got um, about a quarter of an hour now for questions and, and comments. All you young people in the audience, with you're the future, you're the next generation. What you learned is okay, it's a good foundation, but it's time now to be able to harness this new world and the new affordances of the technology and but now be able to live up to the to this purpose here. Uh, we our hope is with you. Now ask the difficult questions.
questions? You should look if there are any online questions. Any online questions? Uh, any online questions? Any online? Is it too hard, too far away from the everyday expectations, like the exam at the end of the year? Well, there is a, sorry, is this a question? Yeah. Oh, no. Okay. It's okay. okay. This is efficient for the development of both communication and written skill space. I guess it refers to this. I guess it refers to the uh, example, and I would say yes, that's what we, would, we try to do to actually to have as a goal successful communication and also to help them through the processes in CD Discover and CD Map with the peer reviews to actually be, improve their writing skills. So they were uh, practicing communication through the live sessions, like actual real life communication they were practicing there. And also they were working on their writing skills through the city scholar and the city map process. So and look, just let me say a couple of things about this, which are subversive. Firstly, encourage students to use machine translation tools all the time. Google Translate is not cheating. So we embedded Google Translate into into Scholar in such a way that you can highlight a bit of anything and then bang, it becomes the translation. So that's one thing, which is use these digital, they're there in everyday life. Um, so why not incorporate them into the classroom because you can learn from them, it's not cheating. The second thing is um, the teacher, as Mary said, um, has a limited capacity to deal with, you know, it's a one-to-many relationship. Um, so leverage students' relationships with, with, with each other, with their relationships more as much as possible. And what was uh, uh, great about this was building language pairs, which were complementary. So in other words, I could do a little bit of Google translation and I could use leverage that to do something that doesn't quite work out right. And then there's somebody who's a native speaker who, although they're not a language teacher, can actually talk to you about the nuances of Google Translate, which didn't quite work out right or did work out right. So in other words, you know, um, uh, firstly, you know, leveraging technology, but also leveraging peers as um, people who are pro-instructors of, of the environment, if you like. Uh, I'm sure everyone in this room believes in student-centered learning, right? We believe that. But in a traditional classroom, it's really, really hard, even if you break them up to groups. In a traditional classroom, a student might get 15 minutes of interaction with the instructor, right? So what we're trying to do by using these tools is changing the balance of agency, actually shifting the responsibility back to the students, but tracking their performance. Because it's possible to track how they interact, the degree of the interaction as they go. So to change the balance of agency, to achieve our goals as educators of the university, these new tools offer us affordances that we never had before. And that's what Omansu was saying about AI, this artificial intelligence, it's the things that human to human can't do, right, in the time that they have. But they are augmented by the affordances of the internet. So I suppose that's what we're trying to encourage you to explore and think about. Thank you. Yes. is partly it's not connected um, in the sense that universal design for learning is specifically a, uh, about the range of human abilities in order to give access to people who would have in a previous era been classified as less able because of the environment. 
Um, but so at one level, it's it's not directly in that universe, but at another level, it's exactly the same tools which make universal design for learning possible. So there's nothing in the principles of universal design for learning that we wouldn't, that this environment doesn't also support. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we have, interestingly, our program, Mary and I um, only teach online. In fact, Nancy was our teaching assistant teaching online. And we get a lot of students who have various disabilities who would find it difficult to be in a, a regular classroom who come because the environment supports that. So yes, it's exactly these kinds of environments which make um, disability not a disability, if you like. Um, um, uh, so, so, you know, like, insofar as people, everything can be moved text to speech, speech to text in these environments. Um, uh, yeah. We have some other ideas that presented, which we call the seven affordances of the digital. The ability to learn anywhere, anytime. And metacognition, reflecting on, on your learning. Um, this very change your learning, and you can do, to do that. Um, what sort of thing? These are the affordances of the digital, which we don't use. Uh, but they're there for us to use, whether it's with uh, learners with abilities of this group or not. So we as educators need to know what are the affordances. We know what the affordances yeah. of the book is, and we use it to the learner. What's the affordances of the digital for expanding what we do? So it's not in the 40 minutes of the classroom, only in relationship with one technology, we call two, the teacher and the instructor, right? So. So it, an entirely different talk would be digital technologies which reproduce traditional uh, uh, discursive forms, right? Simply reproduce them, you know, video lectures, tests, you know, learning management systems which are quasi-syllabi and so on. Um, you know, the tragedy of those things is that there's a lot more possible in the digital space which we don't, which we don't use. Hence the word affordance. Affordance is about possibility. Um, uh, so a completely different talk would be, what are the possibilities that we don't use? So we saw some of those possibilities in the work that old Nancy was doing there, um, which is collaborative work, peer-to-peer -peer work, um, uh, uh, work involving classes across national boundaries where you know, peers can usefully help each other um, in a, you know, if, if it's carefully scaffolded and carefully organised. So, yeah. And of course, the universal design for learning stuff is a, a radical critique of traditional classrooms. That's in reality what it is. And the, the interesting thing about universal design for learning becomes good for all of us. So, you know, an apocryphal story is that, um, you know, the, the subtext that's um, under, uh, what I call it, um, you know, on television screens, the, the closed captioning, closed captioning, yeah, um, was originally designed for people with various impairments. And now we all rely on closed captioning all the time. <laughs> so, yeah. But there's an infrastructure uh, requirement, not just the finances in terms of the new technology, the new technology is everywhere in our universities now, and its affordances. It's working in teams to harness the affordances. So it's not possible, you know, you and the computer science, you and the technician, you and the colleague next door, but we have an image of ourselves as professors, teachers, and instructors as the font of all knowledge with our books. And it's just our classroom and the door's closed. Well, the internet has broken that apart and our kids do it with their phones in their pockets or their phones in their heads. So how are we still into that profession as the singular font of knowledge? Okay. So I said, shockingly radical. Okay. Um, yeah, there's a question the chat, yeah. yeah. Well, I think this is one of the yeah, yeah. yeah. Is how did uh, Shaston's react to this type of teacher and uh, I, I like that question because um, the translingual environment, the way we used uh, the digital tools, help. Uh, we had a few size students. <laughs> And you can see that at the end, all of them uh, told me that it was very comfortable, the whole environment for me to communicate, because the whole process, it wasn't uh, putting them there, out there and having them uh, talk and use their target language, but it was very constructive and scaffolded, and they were uh, interacting with their peers, so they were getting familiar with their peers, both in the platform asynchronous, asynchronously, but also uh, in the live sessions, 
And this, they, that's how they were building their relationships. And the fact that there was uh, no mistake that uh, they, there, was, there, there wasn't any mistake that they could use. So they could use their native language, which made them feel comfortable. And that's how even shy students, they felt comfortable and they were interacting and they were engaging. And I, it's not, it's not a, I'm telling this like very sincere that they were all very happy and they were very, very comfortable. And they were all told me that this is the first time that I'm in a language learning course and I don't feel stressed because I can use and I can, in my native language. And that's not a crime, that's not a mistake. But I, I'm, I'm free to use how, and communicate however I can. But at the same time, I'm learning. So that was uh, very exciting. Uh, so, thank you for talking. It's very interesting. I just have a question about, you know, post COVID, and I sort of noticed that my students went back into the classroom and face to face lessons. And some things are different, especially with freshman students, but also this is a university software students. They had a year and a half of this digital experience. And, you know, I would imagine that some of them were eager to come back to the classroom and interact. It wasn't the case. I don't know if you felt that you know all the learning experiences from this acceleration to the digital that we were all forced to do. Was it a positive thing educationally? And, and was it just my deficit as an instructional designer to get my students to the process like you know, because I don't know if we actually took advantage of it. For most people. Uh, educators and students, it was a horrible experience because they weren't prepared for it. They didn't know how to do it. They quickly were given rubbish to, to do. Uh, the LMSs were only, as so I said, upload, download, have, have, have a you know, chat maybe or an exam at the end. So for many people, it was terrible. However, one of the affordances, which is ubiquitous learning, everybody likes. You know, the professors don't want to come back. The students don't want to come back. They like that ubiquitous learning. They also like collaboration, you know, which they got more, you know, with, with through whatever means there was. So something radical has happened that we can't move back from. But the tools we have at the moment, we have to be honest, do not meet our values and expectations. That's why we invented Scholar. Uh, and we invented Scholar long before COVID. Very long before COVID, we, we just thought that you know those proprietorial uh, LMSs, which all our universities give millions of dollars to for those people, uh, which are pretty archival kinds of devices, don't do what we want to do. So you have to struggle. You know, you have to work with others. You have to learn the lessons. And I mean, we've got a paper about what the lessons are. But we, our Nancy is a gift to us because she showed what's possible, right? You know, we, we, we do it ourselves, but to have somebody else reproducing it their way for another purpose is a gift. And uh, um, you have to work from the margins to influence the center. So I can't give you a positive answer because all, all we know is that nobody wants to go back, whether they're working in a proper business, uh, not a proper, you know, outside or inside the institution. We have to figure out what that means for our patients. Bill? Uh, yes, and I think one of the, uh, yeah. well, I mean, we've been fortunate in a way because we've been able to build stuff. So, you know, I think if, if we were captive to the dreadful illnesses, I mean, you know, people use them and people get used to them. And it's like um, Stockholm syndrome, I think, you know, people kind of, end up loving their oppressors, so to speak, because there is no alternative. Um, as outside, as people who don't use those LMSs, we only use the scholar environment, and we've been incredibly fortunate to get grants to build this darn stuff and to experiment with something new. And as Nancy said, the students struggled a bit, they found it a bit hard. You know, we, Nancy was working with a wonderful software developer we have and building stuff as we went and fixing things as we went, so it was a bit, but we've been very lucky to be able to try and imagine something different 
Now, you know, I won't mention the names of the learning management systems because it's probably live. live. They, they are frankly dreadful. But even when people were forced into them as a first step by COVID, it was a transformative experience, no matter what their limitations are. Now, our responsibilities as scholars who work in this area is to try and think one step ahead, to do research about how learning and teaching might be different, how that learning experience might be different. So, you know, we're kind of um, uh, yeah, in this strange sort of sometimes surreal environment where we, we, we wonder whether we're being <laughs> realistic or not. But, you know, that's what our responsibility as scholars are to think is, okay, what's the next generation into environment? What's possible? Right. I was speaking earlier to you, but one of our most famous professors, Jim Anderson, uh, African American scholar of national and international repute, you know, he used to have the biggest classes, you know, the people from all over the university come to his classes, and he would lecture, right? And at the end, there'd be some questions, and the questions were usually by self righteous white girls. Nobody else would speak in his class. Then he shifted it into an online environment, and he was extraordinarily amazed by the level of engagement, the level of, around difficult issues around racism, systemic racism, and prejudice, things he couldn't get going in the classroom without difficulty, right? And he became a convert and it was wonderful, you know, that he was a bit administrator as well, uh, because it was those goals, you know, how do you engage around those goals and what are the affordances of the digital to help you get there. So there are examples like that. I, I know in medicine now, you know, they can't work without the digital, you know, the simulations that they use, um, you know, engineering, many, many disciplines uh, are, are harnessing the affordances of the digital. Educators who should have been ahead of the game are, are a bit slower. And language, of course, lends itself to the affordances of the digital or meaning making. Okay, well, so thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you.